welcome to another episode of Open Source. And I'm delighted to have, as usual, returning Mark Simpson and Rory Unsworth. Can I have a wave and a kiss? Thank you, Rory. <laughs> Excellent. So we're back to our old format today. We're going to be discussing what we found was interesting and what made us wonder in the news. So, Mark, do you want to kick it off and tell us what Ben is behind you? Well, this you might remember. Um, is an image of something that we did a while back. It's concerts. Now, my, my kids would joke and say, yeah, a long, long while back, even pre-COVID. But um, it was an interesting piece of news this week about Ticketmaster subsidiary Live Nation. And they've announced a partnership with the blockchain digital tracking, ticketing service, sorry, called Fandragon. Fandragon is not new, um, but they've got a blockchain base on this. And... You know, we know that events took an absolute hammering along the entertainment industry in the last year and things are starting to open up. I mean, we've, we've seen some online virtual events, but the idea around the, this solution is, you know, far greater transparency and um, trying to control fraud, improves increased uh, security as well. So. Yeah, Live Nation and Fandragon will be using um, this digital entertainment wallet, uh, wallet and a mobile app called tix to me T-I-X-T-O-Me, and it helps to connect them. So you can you can purchase and access the tickets from your app as you'd kind of expect. Um, it also tries to create greater intimacy, connecting with artists and ticket holders for updates and other forms of communication, knowing that the people that own the tickets um, and again, whilst they're talking about fraud, um, and I think in part ticket tights, um, they're trying to put greater control into it. Um, it's nothing new, I guess, from from um, being a blockchain base because Travala, TripAdvisor, they partnered mm. recently to, to bring that um, travel backing piece on. But what I find interesting is for me, will people like Ticketmaster go to full provenance from source to ticket distributor to attendee. Um, I really wonder if they're going to go that far because it's amazing when ticket sales suddenly come online, how the fact that people like the major ticket um, distributors have already got all the tickets. Um, you know, I've seen this in sports where actually, you know, rugby tickets, um, you see the, the rugby club it allocated to and then it's sold through a major chain. If we've got full provenance from this ticket was issued to this is the person that attended it, it'd be really interesting to see how many pairs of hands it goes through. But Mark, what does that give you, let's say, beyond kind of Apple Wallet or whatever, in, in your opinion? I think it gives me this provenance and I can see in this, in, it's almost very much like supply chain, really. Um, I can see what's happened to that ticket during the journey. I might even be able to see the price of it. Um, as it rises and falls. I mean, now I know there's always a face value on it, but I can also be assured that it's a genuine ticket when I turn up and mm. it's not a fraudulent ticket that, um, you know, you, you turn up, sorry, we've already scanned that. There's already somebody in your seat. So there's definitely that piece, but they're also trying to cut out the ticket tags and scalping, mm. but, it, but also use that security as a way of increased intimacy with the artists. But I wonder if they really needed a blockchain for that. I mean, if, for example, a ticket master could just do it on a central database and do it in a centralized that. database. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can argue some of it's trading off of the blockchain security and encrypted piece. Yeah, I guess. I mean, you, <clears throat> if you do have it distributed and it's through a much bigger distribution network, you can see how having a distributed technology solution could support that as well. Yeah, I mean, I can see how it could work, you know, for some major concerts that will attract an audience from around the world who will want to come to that mm -hmm. event. I mean, for example, I don't know, the one that jumps to my mind is the three Sopranos, you know, before when Pavarotti was still alive, mm -hmm. you would have had, you know, people who come all around the world for this one concert, right? And yeah. I guess in that instance, you know, I'd more of a distributed approach is probably makes more sense, but, um, but it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Rory. Tell us, what is it in the news that made you wonder, or that you found interesting this week? <laughs> well, mine is a bit of an anomaly. It's very uh, far away from Mark's, but it's actually some thoughts around our business, right? Insurance from a law firm. And I know that sounds sound a very <laughs> thing, 
start because normally law firms what they do is they take hold of a subject gdpr whatever an arising topic and they basically say have you thought of this have you thought of that and they hedge it and they're completely non-committal so they don't give that much value but this one actually was the exception and it is published in the times very insightful about the future of insurance and um highlighting that the future topics around insurance are very legal topics are very different from the from the previous ones, right? Where previously you were talking about insurability and all this kind of stuff. Now you're looking much more at, you know, data protection and you're looking, but basically they're saying, assuming insurers are gonna get much more involved in client business choices, rather than just picking up pieces after a disaster, what are the implications of that, you know, in terms of the law applicable to, to insurance? So, I found it really, um, really interesting and stimulating, and it reminded me of, of, of the, the birth of, you know, the, the birth of um, fire, um, fire services, modern fire services was basically mm. insurers wanted to prevent as much as they could, right? So they sponsored them. And I think they're, they're making the same point that when the data is flowing from clients as much as it is going to clients from insurers, that push me pull you effect is going to um, change the preventive aspect, emphasize the preventive as aspect that insurers have always done to a certain extent, but can do even more of and put them much more uh, in, in solving upfront clients, clients choices and uh, supporting them. So I found that really interesting. I'll put a link on the on the thread. That's good. Too. Yeah, that's a favorite soapbox of mine. Yeah, that's a good way. <laughs> Let's move away from risk mitigation into <laughs> yep. risk management. I was going to add climate change to that as a risk mitigation strategy, but let's yeah. step away from that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, back to you, Mark. What is it in the news that made you wonder? So, surveillance. Right. Um, so, it was a, an interesting article that I picked up um, this morning. So, the EU is sat set to ban artificial intelligence that's used for mass surveillance for ranking of social behaviors um ai systems that are used around that and uh almost in line with some of the gdpr stuff uh, companies that develop ai if they fail to comply with the new rules then they could face fines as high as four percent of global revenue um so it's a new set of leg legislation proposed by the the uh, european commission um, and, and a few things that it includes, so AI systems used to manipulate human behavior, exploit information about individuals or groups, carry out social scoring or used to, uh, for indiscriminate surveillance will be banned. Um, remote biometric ID systems used in public places, so facial recognition would need special authorization from authorities. Um, any AI that's considered high risk would have to undergo inspections before deployment. Um, and that's the sort of things that could endanger people's safety, lives, fundamental rights, um, the EU democratic, democratic process um, as well. Um, now, some people will be able to undertake the assessments themselves, but others will have to be checked by third parties. Um, it's interesting that some of the exclusions in this include military use. Um, <laughs> You know that that will be an exception. Um, what what was also interesting as well is, um, you know, AI is, you know, becoming more and more um, embedded in parts of what we do. Anything from you know the shopping suggestions, the voice assistants, Alexa's listening in the corner of the room to me now, and so is Siri. They're both smirking. Um, but you know all the decisions about how you hire, about insurance, about law enforcement. It's making sure that, you know, from an EU perspective, that this is all transparent, but it's against that tension of trying to catch up with the US and China from a tech point of view in terms of how they're rolling out AI. Um, so it might hinder firms, that's a concern. Yes. And again, the, the commissioner and the regulators are saying, well, we've got to be clear about getting the balance right. But what it really made me wonder is, so how are tech codes actually going to prove that they comply with this? And how will the regulators be confident that they actually are? Because it's pretty complicated stuff, let's be, yes. let's be frank. And will the AI need to be audited as it learns as a continual process? It's almost got a check in, oh, I've, I've got some new insight. Is this in breach or not? So, you know, it's the classic that privacy and freedom don't come cheap. And I certainly see an audit growth market 
on the back of this news. It's going to be pretty what's interesting. What's fascinating, sorry, what's fascinating about this is that a lot of those companies are incredibly secretive about the code of their AI. And Absolutely. the only way this can happen is they basically they open their black box for the EU commissioners, you know, to look into it. And I mean, I understand what they're trying to do, and I mean, all in the favor. But yes, it's it's going to affect development of AIs, which in the end are going to be ever present in everything we do in the future. Yeah, and it's this common thread, isn't it, with technology that um, overlook governance at your peril. Mm anticipate what governance might mean make sure you're speaking to policy makers and regulators and testing the temperature throughout the process if you're doing anything new and groundbreaking yeah yeah i mean i mean i was thinking for example in china where you can pay with just your face yeah <laughs> you know, absolutely shops and like that and i was thinking about that that could be integrated into so many different systems mm -hmm. yeah um but yeah it's definitely fascinating one to see how it's going to develop uh, Rory, what is it in the news that made you wonder? Well, well, I don't think anybody would pay me anything for my face, but um, <laughs> the, uh, what, what made me wonder was, should, should we in the intro blocks community go into desk design? You know, I think this could be the new lucrative thing because I, I, I just started working for a company. Really um, great so far. And, um, and on day three, they offered me a new desk for my home, right? Nice from a catalog and it's arriving in a couple of days and um it's one of those you know those adjustable height ones and all motorized and stuff and it, they have at the same time announced to us this week that they're taking out one of the floors that they used to rent so they basically reduced from three floors to two floors that's a huge saving redeploying the money into people's home desks you know and I think this will be great for the frictional costs of insurance companies as we reduce the bricks and mortar piece. But does it create new growth? You know, is, the, is the, this mental health thing that we're worried about uh, from people working too much from home, is that something where, you know, they will have to invest more? This company that I'm working for, every second day, there's some kind of new activity designed to make you aware of your um, psychological state and manage that. And, you know, there, there are um, measures around desks and home comfort and this kind of thing. So I just, I just see a kind of transition. I'm wondering about the transition of investment that insurance companies make in their infrastructure, going from the physical to the well-being, you know, and um, is that a growth space? Why not? But I got a quick question for you. So let's say your employer, you know, I'd say I work with them too. I'm in their office and I break my hand through one of their those desks, you know, that go up and down, right? And I sue them. Fine. Yeah. Now that same desk, I now have it at home, right? They offer it. Now, if I break my hand on that desk, do I sue them? Even though it's in my home, but it's their property? <laughs> <laughs> a very specific question. Well, I guess you'd sue the manufacturer because it's not your company that, that um, guarantees the safety of the desk, right? Mm. Uh, so, so it's- But it does in the office space, doesn't it? No, you, and this is you, you're you're already like an insurance person now, Wally. I've seen this <laughs> immediately looking at what's wrong, but but actually, even as a home worker, if you become a remote worker, there will be workplace assessments. Right, health and safety is a dual responsibility, so if the employee cannot abdicate that, so you're responsible for your workspace, be that at home, elsewhere. So there are lots of other things. Um, but I was interested that that's what you picked up on first. <laughs> I was you know thinking about it, if I can if I can sue Intrablocks, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you're a separate entity. But, <laughs> but I think Rory, um, it's a great example of more uncharted ground, and, and lots of things point. that we'll explore yep. um, on lots of fronts, um, in lots of ways. That, and again, there won't be one cookie cutter approach, and um, not even with you know for organizations within organizations, individuals will have to navigate it. I think what it's going to definitely do um, is, is really emphasize the quality of leadership and care and the culture and relationship between employees and their organization, employees and each other around that, particularly as we start to move to a hybrid model as well. You know, I already think in working remotely, that's put um, communication stresses on on the leaders that weren't particularly effective of that when you're in the office it's pretty easy you know as, as long as you tell one person they, they generally will 
share the news with other people. Um, when people are remote, that's far more challenging. People have to spend more time you know, asking and taking care. You've got to measure in different ways. As we move back to a hybrid with some people in, some people not in and certain days, there's a lot to, to navigate. Um, you know, if, if we were to stretch the metaphor to your desk, it wouldn't be just going up and down, it would be going sideways, it would be spinning, it would be turning inside out and changing colour. Yeah, I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, the future of work on this on this show, haven't we? And this, mm. you know, I'm seeing it now live. I'm seeing that simply yeah. they're reducing by one third our building. Absolutely. Um, they're, they're taking, they're annexing part of our houses, but in, in a very kind way, including support for, you know, your mind state and your, and your physical state. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but they're not banking on a return, you know, in the sense no. that everyone's welcome to go back from um, sometime in May. Everyone can go back to work and apply for for, for the right to go back, but um, they're banking on a reduced working area with a different form of future work. Yeah, and it definitely makes a difference. I mean, I I had a, a meeting with a client in a client's office this week on Tuesday, and I was. I was I was so excited about doing that and it's so nice to be in the same room with another person and work in the same room and pick up all the other cues and it, and it was it was fantastic um and again i i, I truly really hope that i won't take these things for granted as they go forward i really really do i really hope i'm going to cherish it as much as i have this week very good on this note to a hopefully hopefully a very soon future where we can all work in the same office space. Uh, look, definitely looking forward to that. If you want to be part of any upcoming uh, open source episodes, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd we'll love to have you on the show. Um, but for now, we're going to wish you a wonderful rest of the day or evening, and we'll be catching with you very soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care, all.